water and climate change. Water flows to man. Climate change won't change this unless we reframe the problem. Let us remember that the issues of climate change are real in all of our lives. Let us remind the world that the challenges we face range from deep hunger to national security. Let us also be reminded that with energy, there are alternatives. With water, there is none. The climate change affects not only temperature, but also rain, storms, the great season, and everything else to do with the weather. Compounding this problem are phenomena such as El Nino, which will bring exceedingly heavy rains when they do arrive, resulting in floods and with it the destruction of crops, livestock infrastructure. We need to see climate change as a wake-up call, not just for its impacts, which we've heard a huge amount about, but because it's caused by a particular system of economic and political growth that's happening at a macro level. And I think if we ignore that, we're going to address the wrong problems. Also, we need to understand climate change and its relationship with water as a social justice issue. So those are part of the bigger picture problem analysis. We really need to start questioning uh, the economic growth and the wealth accumulation model that's been happening and hasn't worked for most people in Africa, or in fact many people in the world, and it hasn't worked for the planet and it cannot be sustained. It's certain for us, to a large extent, access to water for, for domestic households is not constrained by water resource scarcity, but by issues of money, capacity and governance. And that's both um, big amounts of money to pay for infrastructure and also households' ability to pay for water. Getting water to people in a climate-constrained world is going to cost more. And we need to understand that already finances are scarce and are not being used necessarily in the best way within the sector. I think it is important to come back to, to a vision and come away from this economic growth model to a development model that is at a human scale and acknowledges issues of sufficiency in the economy. That it's not growth till the end, but we know when we've got enough and that we're building up and growing people who do not have enough. Part of the vision is also that our response is not just for climate change impacts, but for a low carbon economy, which is a very different model of how the economy works. The human scale development model is one that puts people's health, dignity, livelihoods, and creativity at the center. Part of the vision needs to be reinvigorated public discourse on expectations of service delivery. What are we talking about? We, we, we pretend that we're going to meet these extremely high levels of service delivery, knowing we can't for all the reasons we've talked about. And we're not given a chance to discuss what actually is the kind of service delivery, what are the kinds of technologies that we want, particularly within a climate-constrained world. Technical solutions are phenomenal. I mean, I think people have some really good, bright, innovative ideas, but those need to happen within a developmental approach. So the technology needs to sit within the reason why we're doing it. I just wanted to pick two main areas in terms of practical steps to support a different vision. And the first is around the importance of building and strengthening local initiatives. In urban areas, we've, we've worked in Cape Town with community-led um, leak fixing and other water demand management in interventions, which are critical. And they're not only technical responses to water scarcity, but mechanisms to build social relations and skills. And this is an important means of building resilience to climate change, strengthening these relations. Strong, informed networks are able to respond more quickly and appropriately to changes. Part of the resilience that we need to build is much stronger social relations and much stronger networks between citizen and state. Another area is, is around participatory budgeting. 
that ordinary people start having more say in how money is collected and spent. What kind of infrastructure do we want? What kind of tariff systems do we want? How do we start uh, engaging around those things? Another area we've looked a bit about is, is water demand management, which is absolutely critical, as I've said. But in many cases, water demand management is not about dealing with excessive or profligate use. It's often around dealing with getting people who can't pay to use less water. So there's a conflation of, of resource scarcity with financial or affordability issues. And I think that's a dangerous conflation and needs to be pulled apart. So we, when we're talking about water demand management, we're talking about that around the water, the resource. Also, re-looking at financing mechanisms. If water is going to be more expensive to get to people, and already in many places people cannot afford water at a household level, how do we start rethinking financing to make sure that there is affordable water for all? And last, the issues of adaptation and mitigation need to be woven much more closely together and not separated. We heard this morning around the rainwater harvesting that it really is um, an intervention that, that combines both. But there are a huge amount of opportunities for replacing pumps with more energy efficient pumps, with renewable operated pumps, um, different scales of, of water collection and distribution. I urge you to remind the world leaders as you meet in Copenhagen that Maji Ne Uzi. Water is life. And that as Africans we've been robbed of water, robbed of life, and that democracy itself is imperiled. We have as a reminder the words of Maud Barlow, the co-author of the book titled Blue Code, The Battle Against Corporate Theft in the World's Water, who said, and I quote, every day more children die from dirty water than HIV, AIDS, malaria, war, and accidents put together, unquote. I hope that that message will become the battle cry of Ankara.